Shall I share it? I'll share. Uh, madam, you can share then. I think she has yes. got some problem. Yeah. yeah, so just tell her to stop. Allow me to share. I'll share. Yeah. So formally, I welcome each one of you and I have great pleasure in introducing Dr. Madhuri Patil. She is the clinical director of Dr. Patil's Fertility and Endoscopy Clinic, Bangalore. She is the editor-in-chief of Journal of Human Reproductive Sciences from 2013 to 20, an official publication of the Indian Society of uh, Assisted Reproduction. Doctor is the assistant editor of, editor of Journal of Human Reproductive Sciences and was an associate uh, editor of the Onco Fertility Journal. Madam was the chairperson of Aspire SAG Reproductive Endocrinology and in the edit editorial board member of Endocrine Society Journal for the year 2020 and 21. Madam is the founder chairperson of uh, Karnataka chapter of uh, ISAR and president elect and founder member of Fertility Preservation Society of India. Madam is very actively involved in uh, PCOS Society activities. She is the vice president and founder of the PCOS Society of India and the governing council member of ICOG 2021-23. Dr. Madhuri Patil is the principal and course coordinator and examiner for fellowship and certificate course in reproductive medicine of Rajiv Gandhi University, Karnataka, ICOG, and ISAR Aspire. Dr. Madhuri is the member of International Reproductive Medicine Research Network, because Madam has attended and uh, presented papers across the globe, and she has written several chapters and edited several books and has publications in national and international journals. Uh, over to Madhuri Madam to take over the session. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, I thought this is a, a topic uh, which probably everybody wants to know because in everybody's practice, uh, we do get uh, patients who are poor responders and the management is totally different because initially we thought it's only decreased ovarian reserve, uh, but it's not so. Uh, though my talk would be slightly long because I put all the recent evidences so that you know what the world is doing today when we manage a poor responder patient. So we know that the successful endpoint of any ERT treatment is a live birth rate. And this then depends on various factors, which include an adequate number of follicles being stimulated, adequate number of oocytes retrieved, and the quality of the oocytes. And this in turn is going to depend upon the ovarian response. And the ovarian response itself depends upon the control ovarian stimulation protocols, what you are used, as well as the ovarian reserve of the woman. So basically, we need to know that uh, it's, uh, I mean, we need to differentiate between poor ovarian response, poor ovarian reserve, and poor prognosis patients. So initially in 2011, we had the Bologna criteria from after the Eshray consensus, and which spoke about the poor ovarian response. Then came in, to, in 2016, the Poseidon criteria, which basically looked at patients who had poor ovarian reserve as well as good ovarian reserve, but still had poor response. And then we had the pivot criteria where it looked basically at patients who had poor prognosis. And this was uh, basically compiled according to the five criteria, which I would discuss. And this was put forth by Yovich et al. in 2019. So what is basically poor response? So the first consensus came from Ashray, wherein they said, and it is called as the Bologna criteria, wherein they said that they have to be at least two of the following three features uh, that need to be present. One is either they should be advanced maternal age, more than 40 years, or any other risk factor uh, which has poor ovarian reserve. A previous poor ovarian response, wherein you have obtained less than three oocytes with a conventional stimulation protocol. And third is an abnormal ovarian reserve test, where the antral follicular count is less than five to seven follicles, or the AMH is uh, anywhere between 0.5 to 1.1 nanograms per ml. They also said that we could 
add a supplemental criteria that is if there are two episodes of poor ovarian response after maximal stimulation in the absence of advanced me uh, maternal age or an abnormal uh, ovarian reserve test so with this criteria polonium criteria we can divide the patient into eight subgroups so one category wherein no previous ivfs have been done and the patient is more than 40 years of age and she has a ovarian uh, an abnormal ovarian reserve test so it's fulfilling criteria 1 plus 3 then you have uh, the second category where uh, which can be subdivided into three wherein you have one previous attempt with poor ovarian response and here you could have a patient who is more than 40 years so the criteria is one plus two you have an abnormal ovarian reserve test you have two plus three and you have the third criteria where the patient is more than 40 and also has an abnormal ovarian reserve test and here you have all the three criteria which are present and the third category is basically which is again subdivided into four is when you have had two previous IVF attempts with poor ovarian response. So the first is there's no risk of poor ovarian reserve and uh, poor ovarian response and normal ORT, that is she's uh, younger and there has, uh, her, her ORT has been normal. So basically this is just a supplemental criteria four. You could have more, uh, a woman with more than 40 years but normal ORT, so it's one plus supplemental criteria four. You can have an abnormal ORT, but there's no risk of poor ovarian uh, response because of her age. So it is three plus supplemental criteria four. And if you have more than 40 years and also have a, a abnormal ovarian reserve, then it is one plus three plus supplemental criteria four. But is this criteria ideal? And the answer is no, because it, it makes it very difficult to manage the patient with poor ovarian response. And that is because there is a lot of heterogeneity of the subgroups because young women less than 35 years with low ovarian reserve with a previous uh, with a pre they could be with a previous history of poor ovarian response they could be young women less than uh, 35 years with normal ovarian reserve with two episodes of poor ovarian response and we could also have women who are older than 40 years with normal ovarian reserve but a previous poor ovarian response the second uh, criteria why it's not ideal is because specific profiles of abnormal ovarian response uh, that is hypo or suboptimal response were not included so we can see that the criteria for poor response varied from 1990 to 2021 so you can have initially what it was same age bmi and hormonal profile we used to use the same protocol then same age bmi and hormonal profile different ovarian reserve and we then modulated our protocols according to the ovarian reserve and then third later on in the century with patients even with same age bmi hormonal profile and who also had the same ovarian reserve there were there was different sensitivity to fsh and lh and therefore different fsh starting doses and eventual ls supplementation were used and the third is basically uh, uh, we have to look into the age related uh, aneuploidies because we know that uh, euploidy rate is independent of the number of oocytes obtained or the blastocyst, what we get on day five, uh, but it basically depends upon the age. So you can see over here that whatever number of blastocysts you have, you can see that as the age increases, the number of normal embryos considerably decrease. And this, this decrease is marked after 40 years, as you see over here. But even if you have less number of blastocysts and if the woman is young, the incidence of having normal embryos is almost similar till the 37 uh, till the age of 37 years then came the procedure working group criteria so wherein they divided the patients into four groups and they were labeled as low prognosis patients so the group one was patient, young patients with adequate ovarian reserve uh, wherein the antral follicular count was more than five and amh was 1.2 and here they again be divide and they had an unexpected poor or suboptimal ovarian response. And we can divide it into A and B depending upon the number of oocytes retrieved, whether they were less than four or they were between four and nine. Group two is older patients with similar criteria that is good ovarian reserve, again divided into two A and B depending upon the number of oocytes retrieved. Whereas group three is young patients less than 35 years with poor ovarian reserve. Uh, and the pre-stimulation para, uh, parameters wherein you have the antral follicular count less than 5 and AMH which is less than 1.2 
whereas group four is older women who are more than 35 years of age with poor ovarian reserve and pre-stimulation parameters wherein the anti follicular count is less than five and AMH is less than 1.2. So why do we classify as low prognosis? Because we had patients with good ovarian reserve, whether they could be young or old, but had poor ovarian response. And we had patients of poor ovarian reserve, again, old or young, but uh, had poor ovarian response. And the third criteria which I talk about, uh, I spoke about is the pivot poor prognosis criteria. And this was from Jovich et al. from Australia, and this was published in 2019. And what he said is that all women who are more than 40 years and above, all women categorized as poor prognosis from previous IVF uh, who had repeated IVF failures also as poor prognosis criteria. All patients with poor ovarian response, wherein they've got less than four oocytes despite FSH dose, which was uh, maximized at 450 international units, and all cases with E categorization according to the pivot FSH dosing algorithms, uh, wherein the AMH was 0 0.7 nanograms per ml and anti follicular count was less than five, and matching the ovarian reserve test according to the Bologna criteria. And all cases where the resultant embryo quality was uh, rated poor, with no suitable blastocyst for cryopreservation, uh, 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 cryopreservation was considered as poor prognosis uh, for prognosis patients. So what we need to look over here, as I explained to you, is we need to look at the follicular oocyte index or the follic follicular output ratio. So here you can see that the uh, follicular output uh, index is normal. Why? Even this patient who has a good ovarian reserve and we get good number of oocytes. Whereas here we have poor ovarian reserve, but still we get good number of oocytes. And therefore, basically, there's a good ovarian response, both in normal as well as low ovarian reserve patients. Whereas a low follicular oocyte index, wherein you get less than 50% of the follicles that are here. So again, it could be poor ovarian response with normal ovarian reserve, as well as with low ovarian reserve. So we must not only consider that those women who have a decreased ovarian reserve are poor responders, but we must also look at those patients with normal ovarian reserve who are hyper-responders. And even the PCOS patients could be included in this group because we know there are several PCOS patients despite having a very good or a very high antral follicular count and high AMH level are sometimes poor responders. And one of the factors uh, for this is uh, advanced age because we know that it is associated with less functional LH receptors Endogenous LH is less potent and biologically active, and there's also an impaired ovarian paracrine activity. And all this basically then uh, results in decreased production of androgens, which is the base for the female steroid hormone. And because of this, basically, uh, there is a poor response. We also need to differentiate our hyperresponders, which have hyposensitivity to FSH. And this is totally different from a reduced or a decreased ovarian reserve. And these are usually young, normal gonadotropic women with normal ovarian reserve who show suboptimal or unexpected poor response to exogenous FSH. They tend to show an increase in the cumulative FSH dose, uh, which is more than 2,500 to 3,000 international units. And, uh, and basically, there's also uh, increased stimulation length. And they're basically characterized by initial slow and poor response to REC FSH and normal follicular cohort with no follicles more than 10 millimeters on day eight of stimulation, or there is stagnation of the follicular growth between day seven and 10. And the incidence is about 15%, and they basically reflect the hypersensitivity of the granulosa cells to the standard FSH dose. It is associated with higher FSH consumption, low follicular output ratio, unexpected poor response where we retrieve less than three eggs, and also lower pregnancy rates. And if identified early, that is between day five and eight of control ovarian stimulation, addition of LH activity in the form of REC LH or HMG is effective in rescuing follicular uh, oocyte number, as well as improving the embryo competence. Uh, so basically, if you uh, look at the recommendations for the OSA ovarian reserve test, we know that the choice of markers 
uh, may depend on the organization, the setting, the availability, the equipment or the patient related conditions. And we know today that anterior follicular count and AMH are the best sensitivity and specificity, but may be associated with 10 to 20% of false positive rate. If a single test is desired, it is sufficient to do an anterior follicular count because it is efficient and it's most used and easily done. Uh, but when we do an AMH, it is possible for us to measure the submerged part of the iceberg of follicular growth, that is the intrinsic, the so-called acyclic ovarian activity, activity. And the clinical use of serum AMH assay may be hampered by technical issues undermining its reliability, because if you're not using the second and third generation assays, if you're not storing the sample collected at a proper temperature, then this can alter your uh, findings. And if you have a female who is more than 37 years of age and she's had one poor response in a previous cycle, then one should use combination of ovarian reserve tests, which include FSH, AMH, anterior follicular count, and inhibin B. And you can see over here in this paper, which was published in Fertility Cellity in 2011, that the success of IVF, uh, basically the live births are directly correlated with the number of follicles obtained in all the three age groups, uh, all the three age groups. So you can see whatever number of follicles are there. Basically, if you are younger, your live birth is always higher in, uh, irrespective of the number of uh, uh, follicles that are present, uh, the anterior follicular count, which is there. Coming to management of poor responders, we know that most therapeutic strategies used to improve the success rate of ART in poor responders have really not helped us much. And this is because it's extremely difficult to establish the criteria to define the population that should be treated or, and or how to treat them. And all types of empirical interventions are being tried, some with hypotheses behind them, which might be biologically plausible, whereas others are with less plausibility. So let us see what are the different interventions that can be offered to these patients who are poor responders. So we can modify the intra-ovarian environment with the adjuvant therapy, which includes growth hormone, pyridocytic stigmine, androgens, which include transdermal testosterone and DHEA, aspirin and arginine aromatase inhibitors and antioxidants like CoQ10. We can also change the ovulation induction protocols and the uh, ART procedures, wherein we can stimulate a larger cohort whenever possible, modify the long agonist protocol, use a GNRH agonist short protocol, use an antagonist protocol, or a natural or a modified natural cycle, IVF, or mild stimulation. We could add LH activity. We could do a dual stimulation. And basically, it's best to do intracytoplasmic uh, sperm injection, that is ICSI, so that we do not have uh, fertilization failure. And it's best to transfer the embryo on day two rather than on day three or five because once you put it into the uterine environment, it is in the natural environment and therefore may, uh, may help in increasing the pregnancy rates. Coming to the role of adjuvants. So this diagram basically tells us about the different adjuvants that can be used. And the thickness tells us about the number of studies that have been uh, published on use of these drugs. And this was from the network study. So there is a beneficial effect seen of growth hormone uh, and especially in patients who have a decreased ovarian reserve. Addition of paridostigmin does not appear to improve the ongoing pregnancy rate or the live birth rate. Addition of low-dose aspirin uh, beneficial effects, again, are not currently supported. DHEA pretreatment cannot increase the clinical pregnancy rate or live birth rate, but it definitely increases the number of COCs retrieved, whereas transdermal uh, testosterone uh, is associated with decreased duration and total dose of gonadotrophins, increased number of COCs, and there was a 15% increase in the clinical pregnancy rate and a 11% increase in the live birth rate. Again, addition of L-arginine, there could be increase in the number of oocytes retrieved, but there's no effect on the uh, pregnancy rates. So coming to the growth hormone, we know uh, uh, its effect on the follicular genesis because we know that it promotes the pre follicular growth and differentiation. It stimulates the pre-enteral follicles to gonadotrophin-dependent stage, and it also results in a proper maturation of the oocytes. It enhances the gonadotrophin effect on the granulosa cells, and the stimulation, and it also results in the stimulation of insulin-like growth factor one. This stimulates the follicular development, 
the estradiol production and also results in oocyte maturation and the growth hormone releasing factor enhances the gonadotropin induced steroidogenesis uh, uh, with cyclic uh, adenosine monophosphate formation. And this diagram very well will tell you about the role of uh, growth hormone and IGF-1 in ovarian physiology. And you can see what it does. It, it increases the androgens, the proliferation, as well as the gap junctions with increase in the LH receptors, uh, FSH receptors, cyclic AMP and PKA and proliferation and steroidogenesis. So basically, uh, they promote steroidogenesis in the granulosa cells and the theca cells through so altering the metabolizing, enzy metabolizing enzymes. It works in synergy, uh, synergy with the uh, with the gonadotrophins, and therefore it results in increased follicular development as well as it increases uh, the antral fluid. And basically, it also increases the estradiol and the proliferation. And through intracellular signaling pathways, it promotes the follicular selection as well as survival by decreasing the follicular atresia. So this was a paper which looked at the effect of growth hormone on the density of various receptors that are present. And we can see that when uh, with a growth hormone co-treatment, the growth hormone receptor, the FSH receptor, the BMPR1 and LH receptor, we can see all of them are increased as compared to the controls, uh, which is seen over here. And it also uh, basically restores the pre-ovulatory downregulation of the FSH receptors, the BMP, uh, R1 beta and the LH receptor density of the large follicles, which may improve the maturation process for luteinization in older patients with reduced ovarian reserve. And it has also shown to significantly increase the pregnancy rate. So there, uh, as I go ahead, I'll, there, are, there is one paper which said that growth hormone basically is effective only in those patients who are elderly and they have a growth hormone deficiency. Then there were several papers which were presented, uh, which were published from 19, uh, 1990 to about 2010. And what they showed is that uh, probably growth hormone supplementation improves the implantation and pregnancy rates in poor prognosis patients. Uh, with patients. The Cochrane Review, again in 2010, also said that there is a beneficial effect, as you see in this forest uh, plot, with growth hormone being given in patients who are poor, who have poor ovarian response with increase in the pregnancy rates. But then came this paper, which was published in Fertility Stability by Sunil Dahl in March 2016. And they, uh, what they did is they gave, in one group, they gave growth hormone, HMG and antagonist, whereas in the other, they gave HMG and antagonist. And what they found was that there is no difference in the ongoing pregnancy rates as well as the right birth rates. And then they concluded that probably addition of growth hormone may not really help in improving the pregnancy rates. And they said that there's insufficient evidence with no statistical, uh, statistically significant benefit. Then there were several other papers. Uh, some of them reported increased proportion of uh, mature oocytes and pregnancy rates, whereas others uh, said that there was no improved live birth rate. So we can see that there's a lot of controversy in the uh, publication which were there. And most of them reported more number of oocytes, but there was no difference in the live birth rate and the ongoing pregnancy rates. Then came this article, which was published in 2019, which looked at the uh, pregnancy rate and the endometrial receptivity, but in women more than 40 years. That's why I said it is beneficial probably in women who are older. That's what most of the papers uh, published after this have said. So what they uh, concluded was that growth hormone supplementation reduced the cycle cancellation rate in women aged more than 40 years uh, who are poor responders. And they also increased the rate of favorable ultrasonic endometrial pattern, implantation and pregnancy rates by having beneficial action on both the embryo quality as well as the endometrial receptivity. But the ESHRE guidelines, which were published in 2019, what did they say? that despite the possible beneficial effects in the poor responders on the live birth rate, the evidence is of too limited uh, quality to recommend its use regularly. And studies were generally small and the definition of poor response was very heterogeneous because they included all the patients, they included those with poor ovarian reserve, poor response to gonadotrophins, and also uh, those who had less number of embryos, though they might be having a normal ovarian reserve. 
And basically, the dosing schemes are very, very heterogeneous because I must have read at least more than 25 to 30 papers on a growth hormone. And what I found that each person has given different uh, doses and they varied right from one international unit to two to four, eight and 12 international units. And moreover, some of them gave only during the stimulation period, but there was one paper which I will discuss later, which they said that you must start uh, almost about 90 to 120 days before the cycle you're going to stimulate because it, it is at that point of time that uh, by the non uh, by the paracrine mechanisms, the follicles are recruited to grow three months later. But what does the uh, ESHRAE guidelines say? That use of adjuvant growth hormones before and or during stimulation is probably not recommended for poor responders. But then came this uh, paper, which was published in 2020 in BMC, and they looked at uh, whether it improves the oocyte competence and IVF outcome in patients with poor embryonic development. So what they found over here is that there was uh, actually not much uh, difference in the fertilization rate, number of feed embryos, the cleavage rate, the number of uh, transferable embryos, and the number of embryos transferred, as well as the other things uh, which, uh, which they looked at, that is OHSS freezing of embryos, failed fertilization, and played cleavage. But what they found that basically the implantation rates were uh, better when growth hormone was supplemented, the clinical pregnancy rate per cycle started and embryo transfer was also better. The uh, fresh embryo transfer clinical pregnancy rates was also significantly higher and the ongoing pregnancy rate as well as the live birth rate per cycle started and per embryo transfer was also significantly higher than the controls where the growth hormone was not given. Then there was this another study which was published in Reproductive Biology and Endocrinology in the year 2020, where they looked at 15 hour cities, which included 1,448 women. And what they found that there was a definite increase in the live birth rate, which you can see from this forest graph. There was also increase in the clinical pregnancy rate. And you can see that the p-value is significant for both here, it is 0.004, whereas here it is less than 0.001. There was no difference in the miscarriage rate, you can see. There were increased number of uh, oocytes retrieved. The cancellation rates were definitely lower and the total dose of gonadotrophin uh, used was also significantly lower. Then came this other study in the same year, but it was published in Fertility and Sterility, which looked at 12 studies and included 925 cycles. And what they concluded was that there was increased clinical pregnancy rate Number of, uh, number of oocytes retrieved, number of M2 oocytes, and the numbers available for transfer. But there was no increase in the live birth rate. There was no difference in the miscarriage rate or the ongoing pregnancy rate, which is clearly evident over here. You can see there's increase in the clinical pregnancy rate, but there is no difference in the live birth rate with the p-value being 0.17. But definitely the number of oocytes retrieved were higher the number of metaphase 2 whole sites also were higher and more number of embryos were available for transfer. Then coming to the growth hormone releasing factor, uh, these are very old studies which were published in, uh, in 1992. And basically after that, we hardly used the growth hormone releasing factor. And what they showed that there was with use of uh, growth hormone releasing factor, there was increase in the growth hormone as well as IGF-1, which you can clearly see over here. So you can see that the growth hormone increases when you give grow, uh, GRF, and here you can see that the IGF-1 increases because we have seen the action of growth hormone is through increase in the IGF-1. And uh, if you uh, look over here, there was no difference in the clinical pregnancy rate as well as the live birth rate uh, when uh, growth hormone releasing factor was used as compared to the placebo. Coming to Pareto segment, the, these were the studies uh, which have been published. Now, after in the, this decade, there's no studies which have been published. And what this study concluded is that compared with the placebo, uh, it was associated with a significantly lower number of ampules being used, higher number of oocytes collected, improved clinical pregnancy rate, and basically, uh, it did not improve the ongoing pregnancy rate or the live birth rate. Now, coming to the second adjuvant, that is androgens, and we know that several uh, of you must be using it, but let us see whether it really has any evidence or not. 
So basically, we know that they exert an auto ovarian, autocrine, and paracrine effect. And the androgen receptor messenger RNA and the androgen levels in the follicular fluid basically correlate with the FSH receptor messenger RNA in the granulosa cells. Increase of FSH receptors in the granulosa cell enhances the FSH responsiveness and the follicular recruitment. And it has been shown that transdermal testosterone when used in the dose of 10 milligrams per day for 21 days or DHEA, which is used in the dose of 75 milligrams per day in divided doses for at least three months prior to IVF cycles may be helpful in patients who have a poor ovarian reserve. So what do these agents do? They increase the intraovarian concentration of androgens, increase the FSH receptor expression in the granulosa cells, resulting in increased follicular production of IGF-1. And as I told you, IGF-1 is very, very important for follicular genesis. And this then increases the responsiveness of the ovaries to FSH, which is given externally. Coming to transdermal testosterone, which is given for about 21 days, this was a paper which was published by Bostu et al. in Human Reproduction Update in 2012. And it showed that there's a significant increase in the clinical pregnancy rate as well as the live birth rate with the p-value being 0.01. And then in 2015, uh, the Cochrane Review also showed uh, that though there is a small amount of increase uh, in, in, the in the pregnancy rates when all the trials were included, but when the three trials with high risk of performance bands were removed, then they found that there was no uh, significant difference between, uh, between the patients who were given control and were given testosterone pre-treatment. And again, you can see over here that they were contacting the results even with the use of testosterone gel, where some have shown improved outcome, whereas others have shown that there is no, uh, no improvement uh, uh, seen after using testosterone gel. So according to the ASHRAE guidelines, uh, what they concluded was that there was inconsistent evidence that testosterone pretreatment improves the live birth rate, the ongoing pregnancy rate in poor responders, and there's insufficient data on the dosage, administration, duration, and safety. And therefore, they do not recommend the use of testosterone uh, for uh, poor responders. Uh, coming to DHEA, we know we saw that there are several studies which have been published on DHEA and all these studies basically showed that there was no statistical benefit of using DHEA. Then came this large study from Zhang et al. from China uh, in 2016. And he said that probably DHEA pretreatment increases the clinical pregnancy rate, the live birth rate, implantation rate, as well as the number, antral follicular count on day two, the oocyte numbers and AMH, and also reduces the miscarriage rate. And they concluded that based on the limited available evidence, in their study, uh, the DHEA supplementation seems to improve the ovarian reserve and, uh, and IVF ICSI outcome in patients with poor ovarian response. But further, they also added a sentence saying that further research is required to clarify the effect of DHEA exposure in ERT. And then uh, in the same year, the Cochrane, uh, uh, Cochrane Review was published, which looked at androgens uh, in women undergoing assisted reproduction. And what they concluded was that uh, pre-treatment with DHE or testosterone may be associated with improved live birth rates, but the overall quality of evidence was moderate. There is insufficient evidence to draw any conclusion about the safety of either of the androgens on the pregnancy as well as on the newborn child. And definitive conclusions regarding the clinical role of either androgens awaits evidence from further well-designed studies. And, uh, and therefore, probably, again, they gave a big question mark. So it's up to you whether you should use the androgens or you should not use the androgens. And uh, here, again, you can see that uh, when the, all the studies were included, there was, uh, there was some amount of evidence that it increases the pregnancy dates. But again, when high-risk trial uh, were remote, depending on the bias, because all of, many, all of the studies didn't have very good bias because there were so many studies which had only a few number of patients. And you can see over here in the placebo or also the, so the control was not good. And when all these trials which didn't have a good control were excluded, uh, basically they found that there was no significant difference uh, 
whether you use DHEA for three months prior to treatment or, or you do not use them. And again, you can see over here that this, uh, uh, this paper published in 2016 showed that it increases the number of oocytes and fertilization rate as well as the clinical pregnancy rate, though there was, not, uh, there was no increase in the live birth rate. But this paper, uh, which was published in the next year, that is in 2017, did not show that it did not improve even the response to control ovarian stimulation. So the ESHRAE uh, guidelines on ovarian stimulation, uh, what did they conclude? They said that there's an inconsistent evidence that adjuvant D DHEA improves live birth or ongoing pregnancy rate in poor responders. And the studies varied in duration of the DHEA treatment the possi uh, possibly contributing to the inconsistent observation, uh, observations what they got. And there's insufficient data on the safety and therefore they said that it's not recommended for poor responders. Therefore then there is a need to identify the subgroup of poor responders that have a theca cell failure, but retain a relatively preserved granulosa cell function. We need to identify this particular population and modulate the intra-ovarian androgen environment which may improve their ovarian uh, response, uh, response and patients for whom other modalities of treatment have failed may probably consider this as the option. So this was the conclusion of the ESHRAE guidelines. And then, uh, then there were studies which showed that there was a, def a definite uh, improvement uh, when diets were supplemented with mitochondrial nutrients like CoQ10 uh, and R R uh, alpha lipoic acid. And this was because we know that with aging, there's down regulation of telomerase activity, and also there's increased program cell death, which could then be uh, rectified. And then this they came in a big study in 2020 by Zhang et al. in Human Reproduction Update. And this was the same study which was done earlier which, uh, by the same author. And this was called as the network study. And what they did is they come they compared all these drugs, that is the HCG, CoQ, estradiol, testosterone, clomiphene, DHEA, letrozole, growth hormone, and RLH with the controls. And in this, what they found was that CoQ and DHEA had a good evidence followed by testosterone. Then each was then controlled with HCG. This was controlled with HCG and CoQ. And you can, uh, and what they uh, found was that the clinical pregnancy rates were considerably higher with DHG and CoQ. The number of oocytes retrieved were higher when HCG was given for ovarian stimulation. Estradiol was given pre-treatment and then growth hormone was used. Number of embryos transferred were higher when growth hormone and testosterone was used. Estradiol levels on the day of HCG were higher with growth hormone and the total dose of growth hormone required was basically lower with clomiphene citrate, letrozole and growth hormone and the global cancellation rates were lower when CoQ was used. And thus, uh, all protocols which used uh, adjuvants like DHEA, CoQ10, and growth hormone produced better clinical outcomes in terms of pregnancy achievement and lower dose of gonadotropins required for ovulation induction, according to this study, which was published last year. Then coming to our protocols, so whether any change in the uh, analog protocol is helpful, so it was found that whether you use an antagonist or an agonist, there is no statistical difference in the number of oocytes retrieved, the mature oocytes obtained, and the clinical pregnancy rate. Again, there is no difference between the short and the low, long agonist protocol. There is uh, no improvement when you use the stop protocol, and it does not uh, increase the probability of pregnancy. Uh, when we compare the GNRH antagonist versus no pituitary suppression, again, it does not in increase the probability of pregnancy. And when short agonist was compared with uh, natural cycle, again, there was no difference in the pregnancy rates. But we know that uh, the GNRH, uh, when we, uh, in this meta-analysis, which was published in 2013, where they compared antagonist versus agonist, we found that there was not much difference uh, in between the agonist and the lo uh, long agonist protocol and the antagonist, and the antagonist and the short uh, short agonist protocol, both in the cancellation as well as clinical pregnancy rates, but there was def definitely a significantly less duration of stimulation and FSH dose with GNRH antagonist used as compared to the uh, GNRH agonist protocol. And then this came, uh, then came a paper in 2014 by Sunkara et al. 
wherein she looked at the three different stimulation protocols, that is the long agonist protocol, the short agonist protocol, and the antagonist group. And what she found was that there was a definitely increased number of oocytes with premature oocytes in the long agonist group. And this was statistically significant when they compared A versus B. And when uh, they also looked at the fertilization rates, there was no difference between all the three groups. And when it came to the number uh, cycles reaching embryo transfer, they were significantly higher when the long agonist uh, protocol was used as compared to the short agonist and the antagonist protocol. And if you look at the number of frozen eggs, actually there was no, uh, not much significant difference between all the three groups. So long agonist and antagonist regimes are better than the short agonist uh, protocols, which is less effective as it can result in elevated progesterone levels in the early follicular phase. And this is because we know that in patients who have a decreased ovarian reserve, we have a very high uh, intermenstrual FSH levels and therefore the follicles start getting recruited early and therefore you have larger number of follicles on day two or three of the cycle and therefore you also have a high E2 and, high, uh, and progesterone level and this is because the E2 levels have increased and this results uh, in a LH uh, rise and this LH rise then results in the secretion of progesterone and this progesterone uh, rise can then affect the endometrial receptivity resulting in lower pregnancy rates. Then came in this paper by Lambach, uh, Lambach in 2017, where he compared the GNRH antagonist versus long agonist protocol. And he found that there was no difference basically in the live birth rate. And uh, when they looked at the clinical pregnancy rate, uh, what, uh, what they found is that though the clinical pregnancy rate was higher with the short agonist protocol as compared to the antagonist, uh, the number of oocytes that were retrieved were almost similar. And this was uh, from a paper by Shimri et al. in 2016. And in this uh, two papers, basically, where they looked at GNRH antagonist and they looked at the microflare protocol. So what they found that the results were better in terms of total gonadotrophin dose use, the number of mature oocytes retrieved, and the implantation rates, the COH was associated with microdose flare protocol. So you can uh, see over here that the implantation rates and the clinical rates were much better with microflare as compared to the antagonist protocol. Whereas if you look over here, the implantation rates and the ongoing pregnancy rate for embryo transfer were not significantly different. So again, we can see that there's a lot of contradiction in different studies which have been done. And I think uh, this, we cannot uh, consider this study because if you look at the number of subjects in uh, this study, which is 45 and 45, whereas this study was the last study wherein they had 220 and 220 subjects. So this is more authentic and you can see that there was no difference seen either in the clinical pregnancy rate, the implantation rates, the uh, ongoing pregnancy rates, as well as the number of cryopreserved embryos. Uh, then this was a paper which was published in 2009 and it looked at the microdose GNRH agonist versus antagonist protocol. And again, uh, you can clearly see over here that there was not much difference in the clinical pregnancy rates per cycle and per embryo transfer. And the ESHRAE guidelines concluded that GNRH antagonist and GNRH agonist long protocol are equally recommended for predicted low responders. And if you look at the worldwide data, you can see that largest, large number of uh, clinicians uh, use uh, the antagonist protocol, and that is almost 53%. Uh, there are uh, the short protocol with microdose basically is used by about 15%. Uh, GNRH agonist using classical re regime is used only by 2%. And you can see that the short protocol is used by 20%, and the long protocol is used by 9%, whereas uh, the 1% of the patients do natural cycles. So today, clinicians all over the world basically use the antagonist protocol because it definitely reduces the burden uh, to the patient. Then coming to the various stimulation protocols, so they looked at increasing the dose of uh, gonadotrophin regimes and they found that it does not increase the probability of pregnancy. Then they looked at initiation of FSH during the luteal phase and again, it did not have any beneficial effect. High dose step up, do, uh, step 
down protocol wherein they started with very high dose and then the gradually decreased the dose again uh, it did not improve but there was a definite benefit seen by adding LH activity either in the form of LH or HCG which definitely improved the pregnancy rates and this paper over here clearly tells us that there is no effect of increasing the dose because you can see over here they divided the patients into three groups wherein they gave 300, 450 and 600 and you can see that the cancellation rates were much higher when higher doses were given though this does not reach the any statistical significance and if you look at the live birth rate again it was almost equal in all the three groups though it was slightly higher in uh, where you have used a lower dose but none of these reached any statistical significance and you can say that basically we should not give a dose which is more than 300 international units and if you look at the the, the IVF worldwide uh, studies uh, we can see that uh, almost 37% uh, which use a dose between 300 and 375 about 27 28% use between 375 and 450 20 3% use between 450, uh, 450 and 600 and they're very small percentage which uses a dose more than 600. But though about 25% still use a dose of more than 450, uh, basically I think the maximum what you can use is 450, should not go more than 450 and using 300 international units is the best option. And if you look at the SRA guidelines, they said that it's unclear whether a higher gonadotropin dose is recommended over 150 IU for predicted poor responders and a gonadotropin dose higher than 300 IU is not recommended for predicted poor responders. So they definitely say that you should not use anything above 300. Coming to LH uh, supplementation, which group of patients is going to uh, benefit? So you can divide them into previous indications wherein wherein you had pre, uh, when a patient has got hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, the patient is more than 35 years of age. She has profound LH suppression in GNRH agon long protocol. She has low LH levels following GNRH antagonist. And if the progesterone is more than 1 to 1.5 on the day of HCG, uh, this group is going to benefit with LH supplementation. And it can uh, you can also have decent add-on indications wherein You've got a moderate and a severe poor response. That is, you started the stimulation and you see that the follicles are not growing or they're stagnating. Then addition of LH at this time is going to help you in getting more number of follicles and more number of oocytes. When there is hypo response to control ovarian uh, stimulation, despite of the normal ovarian reserve test, again, LH may help. And when there is poor follicular genesis, uh, again, it is an indication to add LH activity. And in hyperresponders, uh, it was seen uh, that when you add LH from day 7 to 10, it is more efficient than increasing the FSH and destroying the oocyte competence. Because if, uh, if they increase the FSH, you can see the number of uh, oocytes retrieved is much less than the, those patients who were supplemented with LH. The number of mature oocytes were also greater when LH supplementation was used. The implantation rate was also considerably high and the pregnancy rate was also statistically higher. And therefore, uh, when you have a patient which is a hyporesponder or the stagnation of follicles uh, or there is a poor response, LS supplementation is much better than increasing the FSH dose. And if you look at the amount of LH that needs to be added, and in this study, what they found that adding 150 IU of, uh, uh, IU of LH activity gave more number of food sites retrieved, more number of mature follicles, uh, though there was no difference basically seen in the implantation and pregnancy rates. Uh, so probably you could have more number of uh, embryos for freezing. And if you uh, look at this paper, which was published in 2014, where they looked at the number of food sites retrieved and they uh, clearly said that there's improved number, more number of food sites retrieved when LH activity was added. And the clinical pregnancy rate also was much better when LH was added. So uh, there was a definite benefit with addition of LH versus uh, those patients wherein L uh, LH was used alone. And uh, they all, this was a study which was again published in 2014 where they looked at LH pretreatment. 
wherein what they did is they gave recommend alleged in the dose of 150 international units for four days preceding the administration of 400 uh, IU of REC FSH in a agonist round regulation protocol. And what they found uh, that the cancellation rates were significantly less, the number of recites uh, collected were much higher than, uh, than the previous cycles. There was no difference in the fertilization rate. The cleavage, uh, cleavage rate was definitely better with pretreatment. And they also found that the implantation rate and the clinical pregnancy rates were significantly higher uh, and there was no difference seen in the miscarriage rate. And again, the live birth rate per started cycle and per patient was significantly higher. So if you look at then the role of LH in poor and hyper responders, according to the Posidion uh, classification, you can see that in uh, one and two, we need to add LH, give a double trigger, and basically the LH should be added in two is to one ratio from day one of the cycle and probably you could use a little higher dose in posterior too, because these women are more than 35 years of age. And what, what did they observe? There was improvement in the follicular output ratio, follicular to oocyte index, and overall, uh, oh, then it was helpful in overcoming the hypersensitivity to FSH. Whereas in posterior three and four, uh, we can give stimulation up to 300 IU with FSH and add LH, whereas in four, probably dual stimulation may be uh, of help uh, wherein you give a higher gonadotropin dose, uh, but we should remember can never compensate because we really do not have the number of follicles, but they've always advocated giving a double trigger. And this improves the follicular output ratio and the follicular set index with a significant increase in the clinical pregnancy rate. And this was a paper which looked at the effect of uh, giving a REC LH supplementation on the cumulative live birth rate as compared to FSH alone in poor ovarian reserve papers. And this was published this year in 2021. And you can see that the clinical pregnancy rate was uh, much higher with LH activity. And what they found was this was basically uh, seen more so when you had moderate to severe ovarian response. But if you have just a mild poor ovarian response, addition of LH really did not compensate or the number of uh, follicles developed or the number of oocytes obtained. So basically adding of uh, LH activity was more useful in those patients uh, basically who were over 40 years of age, who had fewer than two oocytes in a previous cycle. The AMH concentration was less than 0.5 nanograms. And, uh, they, and then what they did is they uh, they used this prosper score cat category. And on these, all these factors, they gave a score of 0, 1, 2, in the increasing baseline severity, and that's how they classified, and they found that it is LH is helpful only in those patients who had moderate to severe, severe or poor ovarian response. And if you uh, look at the gonadotrophins, what they used, uh, you can see that maximum use a combination of REC FSH and HMG, and about 20% each use just SMG alone or REC FSH alone. And then there are others who also use REC LH and FSL because we know REC LH is very, quite expensive, so HMG gives good enough dose. There's a small percentage which uses REC FSL with low dose of HCG. And uh, many of the HMGs today do have HCG as their component for LH activity. So we know that gonadotrophins cannot manufacture follicles de novo, and we can reduce the patient burden basically by performing a mild IVF using a modified natural cycle, double stimulation, or a random start uh, protocol with or without adjuvant tre uh, treatment. So when we talk about mild stimulation, what we do over here is we combine clomiphene or letrozole with the gonadotrophins in an antagonist protocol. And uh, of what the ESHRAE guidelines, as well as there was a paper which was published by Gita Nargun in uh, 2020 has shown that there is insufficient evidence to recommend mild stimulation in normal or hyper responders, but may be recommended in poor responders to decrease the burden of treatment, though the quality of evidence is very, very low. And there is about moderate to high quality evidence on the pregnancy outcome, where there is no increase in the live birth rate with the use of clomiphene citrate gonadotropin in poor responders. So when we are using the combination, what, uh, what the oral Ovulations do, they basically they stimulate the recruitment of number of small follicles and gonadotrophins 
sustain the growth of these recruited follicles. And uh, when you combine clomiphene with GnRH antagonist, uh, this uh, paper, which was published in 2017, uh, they showed that CC reduces the FSH consumption, but there is no change in the live birth rate in patients who are poor responders. And when we talk about letrozole, again, there's a reduction in the number of FSH uh, ampules without a relevant impact on the mean number of oocytes uh, which have been retrieved as well as the live birth rates. And the Cochrane uh, database in 2017 concluded, uh, concluded that there's no conclusive evidence on the difference between CC or letrozole with or without gonadotrophins uh, differed from gonadotrophins alone in a GnRH agonist or antagonist protocol with respect to the live birth rate in women who are poor responders. Use, uh, use of CC and letrozole basically only reduces the amount of gonadotrophins required. And it has also been seen that it is associated with increase in the incidence of cycle cancellation as well, uh, as, well as reduction in the number of oocyte retrieved in poor responders. So basically uh, what it signifies is that we should not, though it reduces the burden, though it reduces the dose, dose of gonadotrophins, we should not use clomiphene citrate or letrozole in combination with gonadotrophins in the subset of patients who are poor responders. And if you look at the various uh, papers which have been published, and uh, we can see that though there is no change in the pregnancy or the cancellation rates between the minimal and natural cycle and control groups, but it basically definitely decreases the burden of treatment. And if you look at the various papers published, uh, one was in 2012 by Polizos et al., where, uh, where they found that the live birth rate again was 2.6, and there was no, uh, and it was in all the age groups. And in 2014 in Kerem et al., wherein again they found that there was no difference in the live birth rate. So basically, what all these uh, the uh, modified conventional uh, modified natural cycle did was decrease the burden of treatment, but the live birth rate remained very low. And so again, we must not try and use natural or a modified natural cycle. And this was a most recent paper which was published in 2019. And it looked at modified natural cycle IVF versus conventional stimulation. And what they found, uh, what they found that uh, whatever the number of oocytes they got, uh, if you see over here, uh, when this was when you use the high dose ovarian stimulation and this was a natural ovarian cycle, the number was almost same. And uh, they concluded that though the outcome is better uh, with high dose of ovarian stimulation and advanced age, because if you look at the number of embryos obtained over here uh, and the cancellation rates, which were much less with the uh, high dose ovarian stimulation and the number of embryos transferred also uh, were, were almost, uh, when one embryo, it was almost same, but two embryos, it was higher with high dose. And the uh, number of patients who under, had Cryopreservation of embryos was much with high dose of ovarian stimulation and the clinical pregnancy rates uh, as well as the ongoing pregnancy rates and live birth rates were significantly higher when high dose stimulation was used. Uh, what they recommended that in advanced age uh, and Bologna, according to the Bologna criteria for responders, uh, modified natural cycle has a role as it is more patient-friendly approach and could be reasoned and could be a reasonable alternative in this difficult to treat group of women who do not wish to undergo egg donation. But I still feel that when a patient of poor response, and we know that she, uh, with a natural uh, cycle, modified natural cycle, she's going to get only a few follicles, I think it's best to use a high dose ovarian stimulation protocol, wherein at least she'll have some chance of conception. And then in this paper, which was published in 2020, uh, where they did a subgroup analysis of predicted poor responders who will benefit from individual rather than one fits all stimulation. And they found that you should use individualized protocols. And this has definitely increased the clinical pregnancy rate as well as the live birth rate. Then this was a paper published this year and they looked at mild versus conventional ovarian stimulation for IVF in poor uh, uh, poor normal and hyper responders. And what they found that mild ovarian stimulation for IVF can be considered for poor responders without compromising the pregnancy outcome, but reducing the treatment burden and cost. But this paper is basically uh, from the ISMAR group, that is the Association for Mild Stimulation. And probably, therefore, they 
recommend mild stimulation. And uh, if you look at the forest graph again, you can find that there was no difference in the live birth rate whatsoever between, uh, between mild stimulation and condensed gel stimulation. So uh, they, therefore they said probably that mild stimulation can be used instead of uh, conventional stimulation because it is going to decrease the burden as well as the cost. But we have already seen that when we add promethine citrate or detrazol, there is definite reduction in the live birth rate and therefore it's best uh, to use a conventional protocol rather than to add promethine citrate or letrozole. And here again, you can see that uh, there was not much, uh, when you look at the dose, you can see that the p-value is not significant and there was not much difference uh, basically uh, in, the, uh, in, the live, uh, in the live birth rate per randomized woman. And here again, if you look at the cancellation rates, again, you can see the p-value was not significant and it really does not make a difference whether you use a mild stimulation or a conventional stimulation. And here, if you look at the number of oocytes retrieved, they, you can see that they were clearly less with modified stimulation. The number of high growth embryos, there was no difference. The gonadotrophin dose was definitely less with mild stimulation. The embryos created was less with mild stimulation and the proportion of high grade embryos, basically there was no difference. So basically there was no difference in the embryo quality. And if you look at the ongoing pregnancy, there was no difference. So therefore this group, uh, the ISMAR group recommends using my ovulation induction protocols. Then this was another paper which was published in 2021, where they looked at the cumulative live birth rate in mild versus conventional stimulation protocols. And again, here you can see that there was no difference observed between the conventional and mild stimulation uh, of protocols uh, in poor responder group. And if you look at, again, you can look at the live birth rate, you can see that there is no difference when clomiphene plus gonadotrophin is used, clomiphene plus gonadotrophin antagonist uh, cycle is used, letrozole plus gonadotrophin uh, versus antagonist uh, cycle, letrozole plus gonadotrophin plus antagonist versus agonist, Delayed start gonadotrophins plus antagonist and low dose gonadotrophins plus antagonist. And you can see that there is no difference whatsoever in the live birth rate. And, uh, uh, and when they look at the oocytes retrieve, what they found is that mild ovarian stimulation uh, could be considered as treatment option in low prognosis per responder patients, given that it results in similar fresh and uh, cumulative live birth rates compared to, uh, compared to conventional ovarian stimulation and a milder approach is associated with low, uh, low number of oocytes retrieved and a higher cancellation rate, although the treatment cost is significantly less. So basically, it's very important that we counsel the patient that with mild stimulation, though the evidence has shown that there's similar clinical pregnancy rates, but it is definitely associated with lower number of oocytes retrieved and a higher cancellation rates. So, and we are not sure what is going to happen in the next cycle. So at least I believe that we should probably use a conventional stimulation rather than using a mild stimulation. And what do the ASHRAE guidelines conclude? That the use of modified natural cycles is probably not recommended over conventional stimulation for predicted poor responders. Clomiphene citrate alone or in combination with gonadotrophins and gonadotrophin stimulation alone are equally recommended and the addition of letrozole to gonadotropin in stimulation protocols is probably not recommended for poor responders. Then coming to double stimulation, we know that this is based on multiple waves of follicular recruitment in the same cycle. And this allows us to recover more number of oocytes in a shorter time. The quality of the oocytes in the second stimulation is as good as in the first stimulation and the euploidy rate also is similar. But we must remember that we cannot do a fresh embryo transfer and we need to freeze all the embryos. And there are no RCTs basically comparing double stimulation versus the two conventional stimulation protocols. And here, uh, you could either have a luteal phase stimulation or when you have a double stimulation to stimulate. Uh, in the follicular phase, you give a GNRH agonist to do a pickup, you give a break of three days, again start the stimulation, use an antagonist and give a give agonist trigger and do a oocyte pickup. And in this publication, you can see that there was no difference, basically, uh, the, though the gonadotrophin dose required was higher in the second oocyte retrieval uh, and more number of follicles uh, were there, 
in the second retrieval and the number of host cells retrieval are also much higher in the second retrieval as compared to the first retrieval. Uh, and But uh, again, you can see the number of host cells retrieved per follicle was higher in the first retrieval. So basically, though you had more number of follicles developed in the second, uh, that is the luteal phase, but the number of host cells at, uh, obtained were less. So, uh, so basically, though you had more number of follicles, the number of host cells are, uh, which you got were less as compared to those in the first retrieval. And if you look at the clinical pregnancy rate, the implantation rate and spontaneous abortion rate and the ongoing pregnancy rate, when we use embryos from the first and the second oocyte retrieval, you can see that there is no statistical difference whatsoever. And in this paper, which was published recently in 2018, where they looked at uh, the comparison of clinical outcome in the dual stimulation. And uh, so they divided into dual stimulation and only luteal uh, stimulation. And the third group was only follicular stimulation. So in the dual stimulation, there were, uh, you can see the number uh, duration of stimulation in the follicular phase, and this is in the luteal phase. And you can see that it's almost similar in the two, but it is higher when only luteal phase stimulation has been done. And if you look at the number of COCs retrieved, Basically, they're similar, similar in this group. But if you add these two together, you get more than that in the only in the luteal phase or the follicular phase. And the, there's no difference basically in the number of embryos. Probably here you had one extra embryo. And if you look at the cycle cancellation rates, uh, was almost uh, similar. Then this was a paper which was published in 2009. And instead of uh, FSH, REC FSH, what they used is the long acting FSH called as polypolytrophin alpha. And if the criteria for administration of HCG is not reached, they, are, they added additional uh, dose of FSH. And what they found, uh, and what they found that uh, basically the total dose of, of stimulation was much higher during the second uh, or the luteal phase stimulation. The mean uh, dose, uh, mean day of additional FSH was also higher in the second luteal phase. The number of host cells retrieved were, as I told you, were higher in the, uh, in the second phase, but there was no difference in the more, more mean number of embryos vitrified as well as the cancellation rates. So basically, what is the advantage of double stimulation? Uh, it has greatest benefits of this protocol in the accumulation of host sites in a single cycle of stimulation, minimizing the time in which it will be performed and it also allows the production of large number of embryos, which can then be genetically evaluated, thus favoring the final clinical results. But according to the ESHRAE guidelines published in 2019, double stimulation and poor responders should only be used in context of clinical stimulation. Then they also looked at using random, uh, random start protocols, wherein you could start in the late follicular phase or the luteal, uh, luteal hall, and basically, all these protocols, what we use is for fertility preservation, but they also tried it in patients with poor response. And what the HRA guidelines say is that basically, late luteal phase start, early luteal phase start, or luteal phase stimulation uh, should not be used in patients who are normal or hyper -resp or poor responders, because basically, this does not result in increase in the on clinical pregnancy rate, the ongoing pregnancy rate, as well as the live birth rate. So now let us see what protocols we should use in the procedure group. So if you look at the group one, basically it has, it has been observed that addition of LH to REC FS, FS LH is effective in improving the follicular output ratio. And this hyper-response basically reflects polymorphism of gonadotrophin uh, and their receptors. And probably uh, later on, we could use some pharmacogenomic approach, which may be helpful. Whereas in group two, basically LH can be effective in increasing the oocyte as well as the embryo quantity and competence. And one could also use double stimulation with blastocyst uh, accumulation, which would increase the uh, clinical pregnancy uh, outcome. Whereas when you look at group three and four, we know that uh, they have both poor ovarian reserve. They could have uh, asynchronous development as well as genetic polymorphisms. So here we need to go for individualized treatment protocols wherein we could use a long agonist protocol and antagonist protocol. And here we stimulate basically with 300 IU 
per day of gonadotropins and androgens may be added in both groups. Uh, but in a group four, where the woman is more than 35 years, basically, though you stimulate with 300 IU itself, addition of LH is very, very important. And when we look at the embryo strategy, uh, transfer strategy, we could do either a fresh uh, transfer or we could do site and embryo accumulation and, and FET. And uh, in group three, basically, because this patient is a younger age group, we require a total of four to seven oocytes to obtain one euclide blastocyst, whereas in this group four, wherein the woman is more than 35 years of age, we require a total of 12 oocytes to obtain one euclide blastocyst. So basically, uh, though you have, uh, less number, you have less number of oocytes, and when you stimulate, you're still getting 70%. So therefore, uh, when the for, uh, when the ovarian reserve is uh, low and the follicular output ratio is high, no gonadotropins whatsoever can compensate, and therefore we should not give a very high dose. And dual stimulation can be option in a young patient where a, a nucleoidy rate is still lower, but may not be an op uh, option in group four. And this paper, which was published in 20, this year in 2021, and it looked at the, the proposed treatment options for group one and two to revisit uh, in a retrospective analysis of uh, one, uh, 100, uh, 1,425 cycles. And this was this paper, which was published in Human Reproduction Open, is from uh, our Indian Center from Velour. And what they found, uh, they, when they looked at the, uh, uh, the demographics, they found that an increasing dose was required from a non posidion to posidion one, two, three, four. The duration of stimulation was also more, and the optimal response basically obtained were decreased as the posterior group increased. The oocyte retrie uh, retrieve were also less uh, as we went from non posterior to posterior one, two, three, four, and the number of embryos transferred. And the blastocysts form also were considerably uh, less. And what they found that there was no difference though in the clinical pregnancy rates if we had good number of follicles between non posidion and uh, posidion uh, group one and two, but it was significantly less in posidion group three and four. The uh, miscarriage rate was higher in posidion four because we know this is because of the age as well as low number of uh, number of oocytes obtained. There was no difference in the uh, multiple pregnancy rates and the live birth rates, if you see over here, there was no difference in the non-posidion, posidion one and two, but it was definitely lower in the posidion three and four. And when it comes to optimizing the IVF outcome in the pivot for poor prognosis cases, what they suggested that they have a pivot FSH dosing algorithm, which we should optimize to obtain at least uh, 10 oocytes. We should do a single embryo transfer for all cycles, especially when they are fresh. Blastosis culture is uh, preferred and vitrification should be done by cryotop method. A strong luteal phase support uh, using progesterone uh, pessaries plus HCG uh, is uh, suggested and optimal early uh, luteal progesterone level should be maintained where you should have 15 to 80 nanograms rising to 47 to 78 uh, nanograms per ml in the mid luteal phase. And if you don't have, you could give additional progesterone injections FET cycles, you could use either a natural or an HRT cycle, but you should maintain the progesterone uh, levels at uh, 20. And FET with SAT is preferred in all uh, pivot regimes and growth hormone uh, adjuvant therapy for IVF cases with adult growth hormone deficiency diagnosed by screening for IGF-1 and its main binding protein IGF-BP3 uh, is advocated. Coming to the trigger, you could give either a dual trigger where you give uh, GNRH agonist and HCG concomitantly at 35 to 37 hours prior to oocyte retrieval, where you use uh, REC, FSA, uh, REC HCG 2000, uh, 250 micrograms or urinary HC 5, 500 micrograms with 0.2 milligrams of triplin. And when you're giving double trigger, basically uh, you give GNRH agonist, uh, you give at 40 hours, whereas you give HCG at 34 hours before oocyte retrieval. And uh, what are the hypotheses? We know that agonist trigger mimics an actual cycle surge uh, because there is a rise both in the FSH and LH levels. And this aims to significantly improve the outcome 
because it improves the oocyte maturity, the fertilization, clinical pregnancy, as well as the live birth rate. Uh, but there were some studies, uh, especially this one study published in 2018, which showed that this did not demonstrate any improved oocyte maturation, clinical pregnancy rate, or, or ongoing pregnancy rate. And there was another study which was uh, published in 2018 said that the good quality embryos were obtained uh, more so in normal responder women when a dual or a double trigger was given. And if you look at the indications, dual trigger is basically used with a diminished uh, ovarian reserve, poor responders, as well as when there's poor fertilization, abnormal follicular maturation, and poor oocyte maturity. Whereas double trigger is used in high proportion of immature oocytes when you have low number of oocytes retrieved per uh, number of pre-ovulatory follicles. But if you look at the ESHRAE guidelines, they say that addition of GNRH agonist to HCG as a dual trigger for final oocyte maturation is probably not recommended for predicted normal responders, but may be helpful in subgroup of patients who have low maturation uh, or recovery or fertilization rate but cannot be recommend, uh, recommended until data on its efficacy and safety from RCTs are available. And if you look at type of HCG trigger, they said you can give either REC HCG or urinary HCG. It does not make a difference, but it is best to give 5,000 international units and not give 10,000 international units. And when we look at uh, in this paper, which was published in 2014, where they uh, said that IVF was more efficient than clomiphene citrate, or gonadotropin plus IUI cycles. So basically, if you have a patient has a poor prognosis and uh, has poor response in the previous cycles, it's better to do an IVF rather than go for an IUI cycle. And when we look at the recommendations for ART, uh, basically the pregnancy dates are, aren't dependent on the fertilization method and they're same with IVF and NICSI. And it's basically, I think IVF is a better method because you're not manipulating the, uh, man, manipulating the oocyte because it has been seen many times when we do ICSI, uh, the especially in women who are more than 35 to 37 years of age, what we find is that the oocyte quality is not good. And when we do the ICSI, many times it results in regeneration of the oocyte. So shortening and the most important is shortening of the duration of embryo culture is associated with improved uh, improvement in the pregnancy rate by increasing the number of uh, embryos available for transfer. And therefore, it's best to do it on day two instead of day three or five. And early oocyte retrieval would improve outcome by avoiding exposure of oocytes to premature luteinization, wherein this, this group, uh, what they advocated that you'd give HCG at a follicular HCG at a follicular diameter of 14 to 16 millimeters instead of 18 to 20. And uh, you do an oocyte pickup at 30 hours instead of 36 hours after HCG. And this was a paper which looked at the trends of uh, in the treatment of poor responders, and what they and they uh, they did a comprehensive review of RCTs in poor responders, which were published in the last fifteen years, and this was published in two thousand sixteen. And what they suggested that majority of the published trials on poor ovarian response suffer from methodological flaws and are thus regarded as being of high risk bias. And there was no positive intervention which was supported by more than one positive study. So if you look at estrogen add back, uh, there was only one showing benefit and there was one which did not show benefit. When it comes to addition of REC LH, uh, there was a significant outcome on the live birth rate. And there was one study which showed benefit. DHE supplementation, there was one study which showed benefit, whereas all the other four studies did not show benefit. And this was only looked at ongoing pregnancy. Antagonist flexible uh, protocol, again, one RCT showing benefit, eight showing no benefit, again, on the ongoing pregnancy. Day two transfer as compared to day three, only one showing benefit, whereas there were no studies which did not show any be benefit, but all these looked at the ongoing pregnancies. Using of long protocol and follicular fashion, again, there was only one RCT which showed uh, benefit, and there were seven RCTs which did not show benefit in, for the long protocol. And uh, day four start uh, compared to day one start uh, during the antagonist protocol, there was one RCT which uh, showed benefit. Uh, then if you look at the transdermal testosterone, luteal phase, and all of them you can see have just shown benefit. Only one RCT has shown benefit. And uh, here again, if you look high dose uh, 
uh, of uh, FSH that is 300 compared to 150, there was only one RCT which showed benefit and all these only looked at the clinical pregnancy rates. So basically we can summarize, we can say that change in the protocol that is agonist uh, versus antagonist microdose letrozole, there was no difference in the live birth rate. If you change HMG versus REC FSH, no difference. Addition of LH later on, more data is needed though effect most likely is marginal. Priming with androgens, again, more data needed. Most likely it's marginal. The growth hormone, again, they showed no, uh, no difference. Dual stimulation, there's no data because most of the data is basically on for, for fertility preservation where you have a short time wherein you require to freeze more number of embryos. Again, natural cycle did not improve the live birth rate. And then the last part wherein I want to talk about the lifestyle modification. We know that obesity is associated with higher dose of gonadotropins, increased duration of cycle, increased cycle cancellation, decreased oocytes retrieve, reduced fertilization, impaired embryo quality, and altered endometrial receptivity, as well as there's increased pregnancy loss, lower live birth rate, and increased pregnancy and perinatal complications. And it has been shown that uh, weight loss has definitely improved. Apart from the PCOS, it has also uh, improved the live birth rates in patients with poor response. And here you can clearly see that the time to pregnancy is reduced with lifestyle modification in women who are poor responders. And here uh, where they look the after in, in the intervention group, you can see the chances of natural cycle conception is significantly higher as compared to the control group. Uh, uh, but if you look at the ovulation induction, intrauterine, uh, intrauterine insemination, there was no difference. Ovulation induction, the control group basically uh, had better response. And when we look at the IVA phoenixy, you can see that it's almost similar and there was no change. Uh, there was no change. But if the patient wants to go for a natural pregnancy, then probably lifestyle modification before, uh, 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 if before is important, but then we need to look at the age of the patient as well as the ovarian reserve when we advise for lifestyle modification. Because if you're going to perform IVF and ICSI, basically it really has not made uh, much difference in the pregnancy rate, but the time to pregnancy has definitely reduced. Uh, optimizing embryo selection is also one of the important criteria because we need to select the best embryo for transfer, which can be done by morphology, PGT, or time lapse. And uh, here you can see that blastocyst versus cleavage stage embryo transfer, wherein they looked at the uh, reproductive outcome, they found that there was no difference whether you do the day, day two or day three transfer against the day five, day six transfer. And when they looked at the RCTs, where they looked at PGTA, they, they definitely found uh, better uh, favorable results with PGTA because here we are selecting the euploid embryo. But one thing you need to remember that if you have low number of oocytes and low number of embryos, it's best not to do a PGTA because we also know that PGT is associated with, a new, uh, with mosaicism. And many a times we might discard a normal embryo wherein the inner side mass is normal, where the trophoectoderm is abnormal. And whatever that one normal, uh, one embryo could have resulted in pregnancy is basically discarded. And here uh, you can, uh, again, we can see uh, that the implantation rates, as we know, that definitely higher. Uh, the number of miscarriages are lower. The ongoing pregnancy rate and the delivery rate per transfer per patient is definitely significantly higher uh, when PGTA is done. And uh, when we look at the SRA guidelines for cancellation, we know that a poor response to ovarian stimulation alone is not a result. Even if you have two follicles, please go ahead and do and pick up because we know that in the next cycle when we stimulate, we are not sure whether we are really going to get a good follicle or not. And, the, and before we do that, we should counsel the individual poor responder regarding the pregnancy prospects and decide individually whether to continue uh, the cycle or cancel the cycle. The, inter, uh, the newer interventions include accumulation of oocytes, embryos, and in vitro activation. And we know that definitely uh, with embryo accumulation, the cycle cancellation is definitely lower and the pregnancy outcome also is uh, uh, higher than in the fresh transfer cycles. So the advantage of accumulation is less embryo transfer cancellations will reduce the significant dropout rate. Uh, it will palliate the psychological distress caused by repeated failures and also higher live birth rates for intention to treat. But it also has disadvantages because there's unnecessary stimulation if the pregnancy is achieved from the first cycle and 
the cost also is going to increase for the patient. And if you look at this, the live, uh, if you look at this, the live birth in the accumulated embryo is definitely higher than in the uh, than in the than in the controls, and therefore probably it might be a promising alternative treatment in patients with poor ovarian response. But I prefer basically doing a fresh embryo transfer because we should also consider at the epigenetic changes and the change in the and the quality of the embryo because we are going to freeze the embryo where we're going to subject the embryo to a temperature of minus 96 degrees and then for the embryo. And especially these patients who have a poor ovarian response, especially those women who have a poor ovarian reserve and who are more than, uh, more than 40 years of age, basically, the chances of having a pregnancy with a fresh transfer is much higher than with a frozen transfer. Uh, coming to ovarian fragmentation, basically you remove the ovarian tissue and then you freeze it. And then what happens by freezing is because it results in disruption of the hippo uh, signaling. And then uh, once you remove and thought we stimulate the AKT pathway, and this then activates the oocytes and results in increased follicular formation. Uh, this was done uh, first by Kawamura from Japan, and he's reported about four live births with ovarian activation. The others which are still experimental include uh, gamete repair, stem cell therapy, gamete and embryos, embryos from stem cells and pharmacogenomics. But uh, we must remember that once identified, a real poor ovarian responder needs to be divided into young and old or poor ovarian response because different strategies may be applied. If she is more than 40 years probably, and she has undergone two or three cycles, it's best to counsel them for egg donation. But if the patient still wants to use her, her own eggs, we should give a chance and not stick to oocyte donation. If she's less than 40 years, we need to set up new strategies to improve the outcome by focusing on the oocyte competence since the number may not be increased. So the take home messages for my talk is that we know that bottom of criteria while being a step forward may still not be perfect due to heterogeneity of the subgroups. There's insufficient evidence for most adjuvants to improve the outcome. Growth hormone may improve the outcome by increasing the oocytes retrieve and may result in more transferable embryos. Pre-treatment may DHEA testosterone gel, CoQ10 uh, in the newer studies have shown to improve the uh, clinical pregnancy rate, though they may not improve the live birth rate. Co-treatment with estradiol in previous luteal phase to synchronize follicles is not beneficial. CC and letrozole decrease the dose of gonadotrophins, however, have a negative impact, impact on implantation and therefore should not be used. Uh, when we talk about COS, there's no evidence for one particular protocol. Though the GNRH agonist protocol law yields more oocytes with higher cumulative live birth rate as compared to GNRH antagonist protocol, but we know that GNRH antagonist protocol may reduce the treatment of burden Increasing the dose of FSH does not increase the clinical pregnancy rate and cumulative uh, live birth rate. And LS seems to increase the number of oocytes retrieved as well as the clinical pregnancy rate. Poor responders thus are not homogeneous for pregnancy prospects. And therefore, each patient should be counseled on the individual basis of a previous, uh, previous IVF records, a previous uh, response to gonadotrophins, her uh, ovarian reserve, and her age. So. We also know that female age and number of oocyte retrieve will modulate the chance for pregnancy in the current and subsequent cycles. And we must remember that all the studies published on the different treatment modalities which are offered to poor ovarian response patients are underpowered and are single center based. And therefore, we cannot really take it as evidence and we require large randomized control trials. Uh, so we need to start stimulation when the baseline ultrasound shows sufficient number of follicles. We need to synchronize the follicular pool with premenstrual estrogen and progesterone treatment or a long protocol because this, as I told you, the intermenstrual rise in the FSH can result in a premature recruitment of the follicles and therefore you will have asynchronous follicles. Some are big and some are small and therefore you might not get good number of uh, mature oocytes. We should use combination of FSH and LH Dual stimulation or cooling, when appropriate, may be tried. Adjuvance has varied uh, evidence, uh, but we could try use of testosterone, DHEA, growth hormone, and CoQ10. Embryo selection basically uh, may be helpful, probably if your lab is good enough, 
you can still with one or two uh, good uh, great one MBOs on D3 could be uh, could be uh, culture to blastocyst stage and do a uh, do a blastocyst transfer, but using PGTA and time lapse, still there's not much evidence, and it might probably result in no transfer of the MBOs. So I would like to conclude by saying that management of poor ovarian response is still represents a therapeutic challenge for the clinician, and it and this group. Uh, these patients are a heterogeneous group with no uniform protocol. And one must remember that we cannot recruit follicles that do not exist in patients who have decreased ovarian reserve and egg quality cannot be fundamentally altered. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel with newer modalities of treatment being investigated in larger uh, cities. And pro probably this would give some benefit to our patients. And I thank you all for a patient hearing. I can take the questions if there are any questions. Yeah. Thank you, Madam, for this uh, nice talk. And uh, meanwhile, we have received few questions. And if you permit me, so yeah. I shall be with the questions. So the first question is, uh, how can double stimulation increase egg collection when the reserve is already low? Yeah, so that's what I said. Now you have multiple follicular waves and therefore whatever follicles have grown in the follicular phase, so we're stimulating them and we're collecting this eggs and there are there's a second wave which starts uh, growing. So that also is low only, but when you stimulate those, you can obtain those also. So therefore you can obtain more number of oocytes and embryos when you're doing double stimulation. And this is because the follicular genesis happens in waves. And uh, another question on giving LH for the increased progesterone levels when it is more than 1.5. Pardon? I didn't. Get... Yeah, the, um, the cutoff for various progesterone levels wherein you need to freeze all the embryos is different in poor responders, in the normal responders, in the hyper responders. In the poor responders, it's 0 0.8 nanograms per ml. In the uh, normal responders, it's 1.5. Whereas in the hyper responders, basically it is 2.2 to 2.5. So if you have this progesterone level on the day of HCG, then you need to freeze all because it is going to have effect on the maturation of the endometrium, resulting in decreased endometrial receptivity. Another question is, ma'am, uh, what are the risk factors and uh, how to manage aneuploidy in poor response? The risk factors basically is age, as I showed you one slide, wherein if you have even less number of uh, embryos, but the age is less than 35 years, the rate of aneuploidy is same, whether you get two embryos, you get 10 embryos, or you get five embryos. But as the age increases, the number of aneuploid embryos increases. So basically, aneuploidy is resulted, uh, resulting in age. And therefore, I said, in a younger age group, you require about four to seven uh, uh, good quality blastocysts to have one euploid embryo in group 3 of posterior, whereas you require 12 uh, uh, embryos to have one euploid embryo in a, uh, in a woman in posterior 4, wherein her age is more than 35. Okay. Madam, uh, another question is, uh, what is uh, your opinion about ovarian rejuvenation in poor responders? Yeah, so ovarian rejuvenation is totally, I mean, you can have medical and then you have using stem cells. Uh, so basically, when you talk about uh, medical, I have already spoken about that uh, the androgens, the growth hormone, as well as uh, basically the CoQ. So whatever little evidence is there and the evidence is gradually increasing for all these, uh, for medical response, uh, for these medical treatments, the earlier, most of the reports and even the ESHRAE guidelines, which were published in 2019, said that is really didn't have much of evidence. But the papers or the systemic reviews and meta-analysis, which were published in 20 and 21, say that probably CoQ10, which is a mitochondrial nutrient, and we know that uh, in women who have poor ovarian response, especially those with poor ovarian reserve and who are more than 37 years of age, have mitochondrial deficiencies. And therefore, CoQ10 will help in improving the oocyte as well as the embryo quality and thus increasing the pregnancy rate. They've also said that there is some evidence for DHE and testosterone. And 
uh, growth hormone basically is more useful in those patients who are elderly, that is who are more than 37 to 38 years, than in the younger group. Uh, uh, yeah, in the younger group. Though there, there are a few more papers, but I, I really didn't put them because they were too difficult to understand for the normal listing. And therefore, growth hormone is more helpful if the woman's age is more than 37 years. When you come at, uh, when you talk about stem cell, that is rejuvenation using either PRP or stem cells which are derived from the bone marrow, basically they're all case reports. We don't really have a large uh, data uh, that is uh, a cohort study, or we also do not have randomized control trials, which will tell us whether uh, these really help in increasing the ovarian reserve. We, because we must remember that we cannot really increase if there are no follicles which are there. So, ma'am, one related question with PRP that if uh, PRP is done, which is better mode, US guided or lab? Which is? Uh, it is US guided or lab, which is a better you can, mode. You can do both in whichever you are the okay. same. You can do a laparoscopic also and you can do a transvaginal also. You can do either of them. They're equally effective. Okay. But uh, what happens is when you're doing a transvaginal, you should have more number of cells because you're having a large length to pass for the, uh, because you normally what we use is the uh, oocyte aspiration needle. So that much volume will stay in your needle as well as in your tubing. Whereas when you're doing a laparoscopic, you just require a smaller volume because you're directly injecting into the ovaries. And another question, if the ovaries are small in advanced age, is it possible to keep PRP vaginal? Yeah, if you cannot see the follicles, basically it's very difficult for you to identify the ovaries, uh, especially if they're small in size. And many a times, uh, it's very, it will be difficult for you to inject because they're quite mobile. So in these cases, a laparoscopic uh, injection is much better. Uh, Madam, another question. Just one minute. What are the risk factors and how to... Uh, uh, what sorry? Uh, what should be the treatment option for young women having menopausal symptoms? So basically, it depends. If she, uh, if you just want to treat her menopausal symptoms, basically you can give her estrogens now nah? because that's yes. going to do this thing. But if you want to treat her uh, for infertility, that will basically depend upon the antral follicular count, her AMH levels, as well as her FSH levels. If they are, the FSH levels are very high, they are more than 15 to 20 and your AMH is less than 0. Uh, uh, 0.3 and you, are, you hardly have one follicle and basically this does not grow, then there's no chance for her to conceive with her own eggs. Then this patient should be basically counseled for uh, uh, oocyte donation. Wow. What is your opinion on giving leucine as supplement in POR? What? Leucine? Uh, yes, ma'am. Leucine. Uh, I really don't have any experience. I can't tell. Okay. And uh, ma'am, uh, what is the uh, means, uh, role of vitamin D3 in PUR exactly and uh, uh, the it's melatonin no, in oocyte quality? There's basically no role of vitamin D uh, basically in patients who are poor responders. It only has a role in uh, PCOS patients because vitamin D deficiency is associated with higher androgen levels. And this higher androgen levels are then related to increased insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, which may then affect the uh, ovulation as well as it can affect the oocyte quality. But vitamin D does not have any role in poor ovarian uh, response patients. And uh, is there any relationship, uh, madam, uh, with the uh, anti mullerian hormone and that poor responders? Means what is the exact relationship between these two? Exact relation means actually, basically, AMH is produced by the preenteral and the small enteral follicles. So basically, if you don't have any preenteral or a small enteral follicles, the AMH levels is going to be low. Right. So if it is less than 0.3, uh, the patient really has a very less chance. Between 0.3 to 1.2, basically, they are. Uh, uh, poor ovarian reserve between 1.2 to 3.5, uh, 
basically they're normal responders and if it's more than 3.5 basically they're hyper responders okay madam i could not uh, get uh, any questions so thank you very much if you permit me then uh, we can stop our uh, webinar yeah. today thank you very much for your valuable time once again yeah thank you thank you madam Thank you very much, Doctor, for uh, spontaneously accepting us today's program, Madam. Well, Thanks a lot. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. I'm sorry that I took a longer time, but I thought oh. that I should be. Uh, I should was discuss everything. Very interesting. For response. So therefore, uh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam. Thank you.